All righty, let's get started. And uh, please adjust my volume if this is way too loud. It's impossible for me to tell up here uh, how the volume is. Uh, also, before I start, uh, I'm going to make an effort to talk in a way that's comprehensible to people, uh, even for whom English is not their first language. So I'll be interested in feedback at the end if what I'm saying makes any sense. Um, so this talk is an accessible guide to accessibility which is how we can make the digital content that we make, whether it's apps or sites or whatever, uh, accessible to everyone, regardless of disabilities that they may have. And the goal of this talk isn't that you'll be a total expert walking out of it, but that you will know what the landscape of possibilities is. And when you see yourself having to solve a problem, you'll know what the general outline of the solution should be. And you'll know where to look to find out more. Parts of this are going to focus on the web, but uh, most of it is just generally applicable to any sort of digital content that you're making. So first, a bit about me. I'm a tech lead at the United States Digital Service, which is a group of people helping the US government be better with tech projects for its users, which are American citizens, people trying to visit, immigrants, et cetera. And priorly, I or prior to that, I worked at a startup called Opower, and I interned at Google and Microsoft. One of the projects I worked on at the US Digital Service was this tool with the Department of Defense and NATO to help in Afghanistan, where NATO Operation Resolute Support is trying to assist the Afghan government in being a better government. And they had this tool that was totally not working for them, so we sent a team out to Afghanistan to figure out what they needed and build them something new and deploy it. This, uh, sort of ironically, for the start of this presentation, had zero accessibility concerns whatsoever, because this web app was only going to be used in a war zone. And if you had any sort of disability, they would just send you home. So we didn't do any accessibility for this. I also worked on a tool with the IRS, which is the American Tax Service, to uh, show you your information when you log in instead of having to pick up the phone and call, which in some countries I think is pretty old news, but for America this was a pretty big deal. And for this one, accessibility was very important because if the entire society is paying for us to do this work, then we need to build something that's usable by everyone. And currently I'm working on this project at the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is uh, the American agency that serves veterans after they serve in the military. And right now, some benefits take up to 10 years to give to people who need them due to inefficient internal processing. So we're building tools to help with that. And for this one, accessibility is important because we need everyone at the VA to be able to use uh, this tool. We can't have, you know, if you had a company where different people use different tools for the same thing, it wouldn't work very well. So the outline of this talk, First, we're going to discuss why we even care about accessibility, why it's a problem worth solving. Then we're going to look at specifically what type of problem we're trying to solve when we are building for accessibility. Then we'll talk about a general outline of like philosophically how do we even approach the problem. And then we'll look at design considerations, building considerations, and testing considerations. So why do we care about accessibility? Well, there are many different types of disabilities that people can have that prevent them from interacting with the content that we build. There are people who have various vision issues, which can make it hard or impossible to see a screen. There are people who can't hear, which can make it hard or impossible to follow along with a video, for instance. Or if your app uses sound to communicate, these people would be missing out. There are various motor impairments. So some people can't use a mouse, some people can't use a keyboard, some people can do both, but it just takes a long time. And then there are cognitive disabilities, which is not a super uh, well-studied field or category. Uh, this includes things like ADHD, uh, dyslexia, uh, but you could even expand it more broadly to be like people who are drunk, people who are very tired. And if we can make our content accessible for a broader range of people, then we'll have more users. And there are many people who have these problems. Uh, these are statistics for the US, because that's what I could find. But if you multiply that out, 
that's at least half a billion people who have some sort of problem that uh, makes it hard for them to use digital content. And we don't want to just cut out half a billion users. So that's why this is important. There are also various documents that suggest that we should care about accessibility, like the Fundamental Charter of Rights for the European Union says that we shouldn't discriminate on the grounds of disability, which you could say if we build an app that a blind person can't use, it's a form of discrimination. And in America, we have various other laws that uh, talk about how people need to make things accessible under certain circumstances. But there's also the larger point that accessibility is just the right thing to do. If we're trying to build an open and inclusive society, then everyone needs to be able to use the content that we're building, and we shouldn't be marginalizing people uh, and making them unable to participate. So next, we'll talk about what it's like to have a disability. And these will just be a few examples of ways that it could be hard to use a computer. One is dyslexia. So this is a JavaScript demo of what it might look like to have uh, a particularly bad case of dyslexia. So you can see that the letters within each word are jumping around. And some letters that look the same, but they're just flipped. So like B and D and P and Q are flipping back and forth. So you can still read this if you take long enough, but it's just harder. So this is an instance where it's very important that we write very clearly, because if someone has less cognitive uh, bandwidth to understand what we're saying because they're dealing with dyslexia, we need to be making it as easy on them as possible. Some people have varying degrees of color blindness, which can make it harder to understand things. This is the London tube map, which is harder to understand, although probably still not impossible if you can't see colors. Then there are people who have no vision at all. Uh, for these people, they would use what's called a screen reader. And up top here, we can see uh, what the Java or the GitHub page for Node.js looks like. A blind person would experience this as this text right here, uh, which I will play for you now. Just one second. Sorry for a slight, slight uh, asshole here. Now we're, we'll just. Currently Chrome, no gas commits selected. Commits unselected. Blank. Issues 541, you are currently on a blank. Pull request 286, blank. Projects 5, blank. Wiki, insights, collapsed, pop up button, end of navigation. Node.js, JavaScript runtime, sparkles, turtle, rocket, sparkles. You are current PowerPoint. Uh, so I totally love how it. Uh, reads out the emojis so well with these sparkles, turtle, rocket, sparkles. Uh, so you can see this is just a completely different way of interacting with web content. So speaking of this tool, we would ask, what are assistive technologies? Well, there are a bunch of different software packages people use. Um, and I'm not endorsing any of these as good products, but just saying that they exist. Uh, so you have screen readers, which do what we just saw, where it's reading out your content to you. We have screen magnifiers for people who have low vision. They, they expand one part of the page and basically scrub over it to find. Uh, then we have voice controllers for people who can't use the mouse or a keyboard. You get a mic, and you talk to your computer, and you just give it voice commands. So you can see here, these are commands that you would give to the computer, like view all links, select the pull request link, et cetera. So now that we know like, what problem we're trying to solve and why we care, let's talk about thinking about accessibility broadly. The first thing I want to point out is that you can make accessible content. One of the reasons I was inspired to give this talk is that I've seen sort of a myth around accessibility, that it's incredibly difficult, and you have to be a 10x unicorn rock star ninja guru engineer to even think about it. And that's just not true. As we'll see in the implementation section, if you have 
sort of a baseline level of effort, you can get pretty far towards having accessible content. Um, so you shouldn't say, like teams that I've been on in the past, oh, this is way too hard, so we shouldn't even try. The flip side, though, is that we will never have apps that are perfectly accessible. Accessibility is not a binary, it is or it isn't. Just like usability or performance or security, it's a constant thing that we iterate on and improve. So we shouldn't get super freaked out anytime there's an accessibility bug. We need to triage it like any other bug that we would have. It's important to think about accessibility from the beginning of your process. Just like performance or security, if you wait until you're about to deploy and say, oh, let's just take a week and make it accessible, uh, that is not going to work. You could find that you've painted yourself into a corner and that it's going to be incredibly expensive to fix things. So you really want to carry it through your entire process, and that's why I've structured this talk to talk about designing, building, and testing, so you can carry it all the way through. Uh, there's a lot of thought that's already been done about accessibility, which is fortunate because it means that we can just follow the standards that have already been set down, and we don't have to make this up for ourselves. One of them is the Web Accessibility Initiative Rich uh, accessible Rich Internet Applications, or ARIA, standards, which we'll go into in more depth uh, in the building section. And then we also have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. And WCAG is a set of testable statements or success criteria, which are things that are either true or false about your app. So this testable statement is keyboard, all functionality of the content is operable through a keyboard interface. So you can go down the list and see, are these things true about my app? And this gives you a guideline for what will make your app accessible as opposed to just feeling like you're in the dark. And these statements are divided into three levels, A, AA, and AAA, with AAA being the most extreme and A being the most lax. But even WCAG points out that we shouldn't just blindly always go to AAA because it's actually fairly strenuous, and some content just can't be made uh, AAA. So you want to look at what the different requirements are and pick the one that works best for your organization. Another point is that accessibility is helpful for everyone. So this is an uh, image of a sidewalk ramp, which perhaps was put in for people in a wheelchair. But it also helps a wider range of people, like people on bikes or with strollers or people who don't want to step up onto the sidewalk. And likewise, keyboard shortcuts are essential for people who are unable to use a mouse, but they also help power users who want to move more quickly. So it's not the case that accessibility is just spending resources on a minority of people. Uh, when you make your app more accessible, it often has benefits for all your users. One uh, sort of problem that I ran into when I was getting started with accessibility was I had an idea of, oh, I'll just you know, check if the user is using a screen reader and then go into the be accessible mode of my app. This is never going to work. Uh, the biggest reason is that whether or not someone is using a screen reader or other assistive, assistive technology is a piece of private medical information that people don't want to be just broadcasting to every site on the internet. So there's never going to be a browser API that will tell you if someone is using assistive technology or not. And moreover, the whole idea of we'll only flip it into accessibility mode sometimes just doesn't really work in practice. Just like you want to have a single responsive website that works with any screen size, you also want to have a single experience that works regardless of what disabilities you may have. Some people will suggest having a text-only version of your site, but this really doesn't actually work. It creates more maintenance overhead for you because you now have to maintain two different versions of your site or your app. And when the two invariably get out of sync, then disabled users become very concerned because they don't know which version to trust. And Safeway, an American food company, was actually sued for having a text-only version of their site instead of one accessible site and had to get rid of it. So text-only is not a solution to any problem. You should just make one version that works for everyone. 
So next we'll talk about how you can design for accessibility. It's important to do user research with disabled users. A big part of design is realizing that we are not our users, and we need to do research with them to understand their needs and their problems. And especially if we don't have any disabilities ourselves, we might be lacking that perspective necessary to make a good design. And I would even recommend testing you know, early versions of your app with disabled users to validate that it works for everyone early on. And that way you can correct issues before spending a lot of time building them. And one example of this, this different shift in how you think about how someone experiences your content is sighted users will look at a page and your eyes sort of bounce all over the place looking for whatever you came to the page for. And as designers, we're familiar with a toolkit of ways to guide people's attention to certain parts of the page. We can make text bigger to indicate it's a header. We can use color to make things stand out. But when we have a non-sighted user, all of that disappears. We just have this linear stream of text. So we need to think differently about if this is how you're experiencing the page, is it still going to be usable? And although it's a linear stream of text, it's not unstructured. So assistive technologies will allow you to pull up, for instance, a list of every link on the page, or every header, or every table. And instead of going through every piece of the page word by word, people will often pull up these lists to go directly to what they're looking for. So as a designer, you'd want to think about how are you structuring your page to facilitate people going to directly what they're looking for. Another aspect that designers don't often consider about accessibility is the parts of the UI that are not visible to sighted users, but do show up for non-sighted users. And one example of this is alt text, which is the text that you put on an image so that if someone can't see the image, it still describes what it is for them. And this is just as much a part of your UI as anything else, but I often find that designers don't think about it and leave it up to the developers. And developers, like myself, can often do a worse job than the designers uh, because there's a reason that I'm a developer and not a designer. So I encourage designers to think of this as part of their responsibility. So how to do good alt text? Well, one common anti-pattern is putting the word image in the alt text. This is just redundant. The screen reader already knows it's an image because you used an image tag, so don't bother with that. The other is putting a lot of uh, extraneous content into the alt text. Um, you know, again, this just gets in people's way and is rather annoying. What you want is something that's both descriptive but concise. And yes, this is a picture of my cat. Uh, there are other uh, places where you want to consider what text you're providing to non-sighted users. So this is the GitHub page or you know, UI for an open issue. And you can see, for instance, with this little icon, a sighted user can look at this and conclude that this is you know, indicating that the issue is open. A non-sighted user has no way to process this SVG. So what we want to do is just specify what the text alternative is going to be. And likewise, you're just seeing someone's picture. It won't necessarily be obvious what it is. So we say assign to this user, and so on. Additionally, when we have text, or when we have an image that is purely decorative, we actually don't want to give it an alt text. We want to just set that to empty because non-sighted users don't care about the decoration we've put on our page. It just gets in their way. So as a designer, we would say, this is not a functional part of the UI. It's just decorative, so go ahead and hide it. And finally, with alt text, we want to be sure that we describe the functionality of things and not what the image looks like itself. So here, maybe we have this down arrow, and if you click on it, it opens up a drop-down menu. Writing down arrow is actually not that helpful because that doesn't really tell me what it's going to do. If I say expand button, now I'm talking about what the thing does, not what it looks like. So that's what we want to be targeting. And if you remember earlier with the list of links, this is why this is one of the many reasons why saying click here in your links is really difficult for people. If I have five links that say click here, click here, and then a screen reader pulls up the list of links, they're just going to get five entries that all say here, and that is not useful. 
So instead, you want to put the link around the thing that it's going to. And then the list of links will be more descriptive, and people can get through your site faster. And there's some content that, frankly, you're just not going to make available as a text-based alternative for non-sighted users with the same level of fidelity. It would be, I think, really hard to get every little up and down of this graph. But what you could do is maybe think about having some sort of table that is displayed only to screen reader users that summarizes this data in some way. So even if we can't provide a perfect fidelity, we still want to think about what can we provide for non-sighted users. Another important consideration is the color contrast. For people who have lower vision, colors that are too close together can be really hard to see. And fortunately, there are tools online that will check if you have enough contrast between your colors. Uh, and this is linked to in the slides, which I'll show at the end. Um, so you can just plug in your colors, and you can see if they are accessible or not. Another design consideration for colorblind users is making sure that color is not the only means of communicating some information. So this is the GitHub UI for what portion of the repo is what language. If we just had the bar at the bottom for a colorblind person, this would be pretty difficult. But they did a good job of also listing the percentages next to each language. So at that point, the bars at the bottom are more on the aesthetic side. And if I'm colorblind, I can just look at these percentages and know what's going on. It also helps that the, each language is sorted in terms of uh, how much it's being used. And that is the same sort order of the bars below. So even if we didn't have those numbers, that would still be kind of helpful. This is the app that I work on. So we originally had this ability for you to leave a comment on a document uh, using the mouse. And then we also added the ability to do it purely from the keyboard so that uh, everyone could use it even if they couldn't use a mouse. So next we'll talk about the WCAG standards and these, these different success criteria. And it divides them into four categories, the acronym for which is POOR. And that's perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And these are issues that disproportionately affect disabled users. So if we uh, fit these issues, then we'll have a pretty good baseline of accessible content. So we'll look at what each one of these categories means. Perceivable means that a person with a disability can experience our app. So an example for that is having captions for video content. If someone is deaf, then they would not be able to watch this video if we did not provide captions. Operable means that, OK, now that people can see our site, how do they actually use it? And one example of that is the no keyboard trap rule, which basically says that tabbing should work in a normal way. If you have some weird thing where, let's say, once you tabbed onto the fork button, you couldn't untab from it using only the keyboard. You had to click somewhere else. Uh, that would be both, one, really weird UI, and two, it would be an accessibility problem because you're forcing someone to stop using the keyboard, and that might be you know, the only thing that they're able to do. Then there's understandable, which means, is the content of our page comprehensible to users? And one example of this is that the language should be programmatically determined. And here, you can see WCAG is specifically calling out the web, but a lot of these standards apply to any platform. Uh, so you can see that the way we do this is we mark the HTML tag with this language attribute. And then finally, we have robust, which has to do with writing our code in a good way so that assistive technology can understand it. And the main point here is basically you have things that are semantically and syntactically correct. So we have a classic example of mismatched HTML tags. This is going to be hard for the screen reader to understand. Browsers are actually really forgiving with bad HTML because they want to work on as many sites as they can. But screen readers just don't have as much, uh, as, many budget, as much budget to do this. So we have to make an effort to write good code that they can understand. So next we'll talk about how we can build for accessibility. 
And I just want to emphasize again, this is not super hard. As we'll see, a few simple considerations will get you a lot of the way there. This is nothing to be afraid of. Accessibility is a place where semantic markup is really important. If you wanted to, you could just make everything on your web app a div and then use styling to make it show up correctly. And sighted users would never know the difference and they would never care. But for non-sighted users or people relying on other assistive technologies, uh, it's going to make it really hard for them. So if we decided we were just going to use a paragraph tag for everything, when a screen reader pulled up the list of headers, they wouldn't see anything. Whereas if we use an H3 tag, then they do see the header. Uh, I also don't recommend using tab index. This is an attribute that will allow you to override the browser's default ordering of what elements are tabbed between. And generally, if you do this, it means that you've done something weird with your HTML. So you should just take a step back and figure out what that was and if you really need to do this. In particular, if you are manually setting the ordering of everything on the page, that quickly becomes a maintenance nightmare. And then if you insert a new element and you don't update every other item on the page, then it's going to be out of order and then it's going to be a super weird user experience. And if you have a component framework like React where you know, a page wants or a piece of content wants to only know about its location and not the global page state, that's also going to be really hard to manage. So the ARIA standard is really useful for providing extra hints to the assistive technologies. And ARIA has basically two parts. One is roles, where we're telling the assistive technology this is uh, what this element is. And the other is attributes, where we're providing additional information about an element. So one thing you can do with roles is you can make markup semantic even if you're not using the semantic elements. So sometimes we want to use a div to implement a button for whatever reason. If we just do that, then screen readers will be lost. But if we add role equals button, uh, then it will show up as if we had used the semantic markup. There are even roles for things that don't have native HTML equivalents. So if you have a timer on your page, you can mark that, for instance, and provide a richer experience to screen reader users. We can recreate headings if for whatever reason you need to not use a header tag. And we can even uh, set other sort of doc structure information that might not be obvious. So if you have a table of contents, you'll probably style it in such a way that a sighted user can look at it and know that it's a table of contents without reading every word. But again, a screen reader is not going to have access to that that visual information you're giving. So we can set role equals directory and provide that information. We can also use landmarks, which allow us to call out certain sections of our page. And this is useful because screen readers will pull up the list of landmarks and navigate directly to one of them. So if you have a lot of content at the top of your page, like your navigation and your header image and all this other stuff, and I don't want to have to scan through all of that before I get to your actual content, I might look to see if you've set a main area that I can go to. Or if I'm looking for a search bar, instead of having to scan through the whole page, because you know who knows where it might be, uh, I can just look for what you've marked as search. ARIA attributes also have the live attribute, which is pretty cool. That lets the screen reader know that part of the site uh, is going to be updating automatically. So if you have a chat app and you're constantly inserting new messages, if the user who's using a screen reader does not manually go and check the place where you're adding the new messages, they'll never know that anything changed. With ARIA Live, we can tell the screen reader, please read this out when you get a chance. And then the user will know even if they don't manually go check. We can also use labels to provide more information about how elements on the page are related to each other. So on the left here, we have a table and we have a title for it. And a sighted user can look at it. Um, a sighted user can look at it and deduct or deduce that the header is related to that table. But a screen reader is not going to come to that conclusion just because we have the HTML sitting next to each other. 
So instead, we can use ARIA to explicitly link the two. And then when the screen reader pulls up the list of tables, it will give it a nice name instead of table number one. And when the screen reader is scanning through, it'll say, like, now entering the overview by tax year table. Another important attribute is ARIA hidden. So let's say we have a modal. And with a modal, you focus the user's attention on one part of the page. And you put up a blacked out background, preventing them from interacting with anything off of the page or off of that modal. Well, unfortunately, a screen reader isn't going to look at that blacked out background and conclude that that's the only thing the user should be seeing. So if we pull up a list of links, for instance, we're going to see the entire list of links on the page. And if the user is just scanning around, they can scan right off the edge of the modal. And now they're in a really complicated, confusing situation because they're trying to interact with parts of the page that we've locked out. And they have no idea why things aren't working. So instead, we can use ARIA hidden, where we mark everything that's not in the modal as hidden. And then screen readers will know it's not supposed to show up right now. And if we pull up a list of links, it will only be the links that are actually in the modal. And if the user is scanning around, they won't be able to scan off the edge of the modal. Another useful attribute is ARIA invalid. As a sighted user, I can look at this red outline and this text and conclude that I haven't filled out this field correctly. But that might not be obvious to someone who's using a screen reader. So we can just set aria invalid equals true, and then the user will know. And here's an example of how aria attributes are used on GitHub. So we have the comment icon, and we need some way to tell an, a blind user what this SVG is because there's no, you know, there's there's no inherent way to know. So you can see that what GitHub has done is they provide an ARIA label that says nine comments, and then the user is able to understand it. And we can also actually mark the SVG as hidden at that point because it's purely decorative. A blind user doesn't need to know that we have an SVG here because we've already told them what's going on. So a few other implementation notes. One thing that I've seen caused a lot of pain is people who get an idea that you must do things in a certain way to meet a standard like WCAG. But WCAG is the what you're aiming for, not the how you have to do it. It doesn't care what your implementation is. So today, the way that we set the language on the page is we give it this attribute here. That's slightly annoying. Uh, but if it were to change in the future, then you would just do it a different way, and you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be concerned about this. I've seen some auditors who will say things like, well, no, you have to use this attribute to solve this problem, and that's just not true. And speaking of setting the language, one reason why it's important is that the screen readers use the language to determine uh, what your content is. So we have another audio clip here. Let's say that we erroneously set some content to be Czech, but then we have it as English. I will play a clip for you of what that is going to sound like, uh, if you can hear it. So that of course sounds absurd because they're reading those words as if they were Czech, which obviously they're not, and it sounds completely incomprehensible. So that's why it's important that we set the language correctly. Uh, and you can even set the language for subparts of your document. Another tool we have is displaying things to screen readers only. This is a thing you should use sparingly because it can mean that we've created something that's not accessible or that this is too complicated. But in rare circumstances, you can use this CSS snippet to take something out of the visual flow of your page and move it off the screen. Screen readers will still read it, but sighted users will never see it. Another technique is skip links. 
you can see GitHub here, when you tab to the first element on the page, this skip to content button shows up. And what this will do when you hit it is it will take you straight to the first actual piece of content on the page, skipping past their entire nav bar that's repeated. And the idea is that if I am only using a keyboard, I don't want to have to start every page by hitting tab 10 times to get past your opening content. And GitHub's doing a nice job here because they hide it until you tab over it. So for people who don't care about the skip link, they never know it's there. And for people who do need it, it's there for them. Another thing uh, that I wanted to show you because it's cool, although this is not, you know, I've said that accessibility is not hard. This is actually very hard, but uh, it's so cool I wanted to show it anyway. Facebook has billions and billions of images, and they can't ask people to write alt text, obviously, for those images. So they use machine vision to try to figure out what's in the image and give you some alt text that at least gives a blind user some clue of what's going on. Uh, so this is an image from my Facebook where uh, Facebook decided it contained one or more people and was indoors. Uh, I am highly disappointed, though, that it did not identify the horse in the picture. Uh, I'm going to keep checking back until they've improved their algorithm enough to find horse masks. So next we'll talk about testing for accessibility. The biggest point I want to make here is that accessibility is more important than compliance to any one standard. The goal with accessibility is can disabled users use our app? It is not do we meet WCAG 2.0 or do we meet some other you know, checklist of things. Unfortunately, I've seen trends where people who don't uh, know as much about accessibility or technology in general will just go by this checklist and say, if it meets this checklist, it's accessible. If it doesn't meet this checklist, it's not. And while that can be a good approximation, a checklist will never be, uh, ne never be as good as just actually trying to address the real problem that we're trying to solve. So we don't want to lose sight of that. And there's one web accessibility group online that writes, for instance, you can be fully Section 508 compliant and yet totally inaccessible. So we need to not forget the actual problem we're trying to solve. And when we're testing, nothing is better than testing with real disabled users who use assistive technology to uh, get their jobs done. If I pull up uh, VoiceOver on my Mac right now, I don't use the screen reader regularly. I don't really know how it works. And so whether or not I think that my app is accessible is really only an approximation of what I actually care about, which is can a disabled person use it. There are scanners out there that will check your app for static analysis accessibility issues. These are useful, and they will identify some problems. But just because you get 100% passing on the scanner does not mean that your app is 100% accessible. The problem we're trying to solve is a human one of, can a disabled person use this app? And no scanner can tell us that, just like no scanner can tell us, is, is our game fun? Uh, is our tool useful to anyone? Is it easy to use? Like These are all human judgments that we need to make. It's also important that we have a data-driven approach to deciding what assistive technology we want to support. You probably have, with your browser support policy or your you know, native platform support policy, some sense of what you're supporting based on what the market share is or other factors. And we want to come up with a similar idea for assistive technology, because they're not all equally popular. And we want to focus on the ones that are used the most. And that's what we want to test with. It's also important that testers understand the assistive technology that they're testing with. Uh, some of these tools are very complicated. I hardly know how to use any of them. And it's easy to think something is not accessible, and the actual problem is just that I don't know how to use the tool. And there are some standards that will even say this explicitly, like make sure that you have people who know how these tools work. So if you do that, you will avoid a lot of wasted time of not being sure uh, what is wrong. It's also very important that developers can test for themselves. Just like it would be impossible to support Internet Explorer if your developers didn't have IE on their laptops, if you have, let's say, one copy of JAWS on the team, and a tester will report that there was a problem, 
developer will take a look at it, think they fix it, send it back to the tester who looks at it the next day. Tester says, no, it's still not working, sends it back to the developer. Like, this will never work. But fortunately, you don't have to get a copy of a super expensive software license for everyone on your team because every Mac and every PC has a OS level uh, screen reader and iPhone and Android do as well. So everyone can use that and get at least some baseline level of does this work at all. Uh, and the final point I want to make is that screen readers can actually be quite bad. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a quote from a web accessibility group online. So these are people who care about accessibility and write a lot about it. But they're even acknowledging that screen readers have a lot of problems. And it's important to not drive yourself crazy trying to fix these problems. One test I like to do is if a screen reader does something weird on every site on the internet and every app, even like apps provided by Apple or Google on iOS or Android, and it also has that problem on my app, well, then it's not a problem with my app. There's just nothing I can do about that. And there are some cases where you'll have a bug that only exists in one screen reader, and you can drive yourself crazy writing really specific markup to try to address that one screen reader. But that can ultimately make the other screen readers perform worse and can become really brittle and hacky. So I don't advocate going down a rabbit hole of trying to fix these like, very specific issues. Rather, my suggested strategy is add as much ARIA as you can, make sure you're writing semantic, syntactically correct code, and then you just have to trust that the screen readers are going to come the rest of the way and, and meet you in the middle there. So now you guys are uh, started on the journey to writing accessible apps. Thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, please let me know what you thought about this talk on Twitter. I haven't given it many times, so I'm always interested in feedback. And if English is not your first language, please let me know if you could, you know, if I did a good job of being comprehensible. And well, I guess I want to know that regardless of your English proficiency, if I was comprehensible. Uh, and then the slides are up at this link if you would like to take a look at them. So thank you guys. Uh, we do have a few minutes left in case anyone has any questions. Yes, Mark. Um, do you know if there's any way in analytics for um, understanding, like, accessibility, like, you have accessibility, like, uh, the, the, the stats? So, like, is there, is there a way you can find out, like, how many, you know, of the screen readers are in use? Because I don't know if they report in any way because it's right. really a surface level. So is there any way to find that out live on work without explicitly detecting it or looking at it in some capacity? Yeah. So I, I wanted to do this as well. Um, and this gets back to the thing I was talking about earlier with the, like, well, maybe Google Analytics has a field. Uh, and, and no, they're never going to share that information for, like, the medical privacy reasons. So this graph, uh, which the source is linked to in the slides, was produced by just polling people and asking what they use. So I basically just go to this group that does polling and see what they're saying. Okay. Yes? Same question from the opposite side. Mm -hmm. uh, because most of the websites are totally screwed. Uh, <laughs> uh, most of the websites are probably not doing uh, good work in terms of accessibility. So how do these people actually know that we have taken care of them? How do, uh, do they have some tools or so some ways to uh, figure out that our website mm, provides some accessibility or, or they are just used to trying and uh, you know, to find out that uh, one in 100 actually supports it? Yeah, so you're saying how will like a blind user know that our site is going to work for them, mm -hmm. essentially? Um, yeah, so my, my experience talking to disabled users is that, by and large, they're used to a fair amount of pain. And most sites don't do a great job, especially when you stray off of like the really big you know, Amazon, New York Times, like the bigger budget productions. Um, you know, I think if they come to your site, they'll just have to be pleasantly surprised when they see that it starts working. There are some things like having the skip nav that we talked about like right here as the first thing that you go to. Um, you know, that will be an early clue to them that you've thought about this. 
if you have things like, you know, the list of links, and this is a good list, and the list of tables, and the list of headers, and they can see the structure of your page, uh, then they'll pretty quickly figure out that you've structured things nicely for them. Okay, I thought maybe there are some catalogs that they are used to using to, to find the, the, the subset of the internet that is yeah. somehow... Yeah, so I, I have seen some, um, you know, people who are, who are disabled have communities just like anyone else on the internet, and they will share advice like, hey, iOS is way better for disabled users. I don't actually know if that's true, but like they will share what software works best for them. Uh, I don't know of a formal catalog, but it's very possible they would say, oh, you know, this is the news site that tends to be the most accessible. You know, we recommend that you go here. Okay, second question, if I may. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I went once through all the ARIA attributes and roles and stuff, and this list is kind of massive. It's, I mm -hmm. forgot 99% uh, of, of it the day after. <laughs> Are there any, mm, I don't know, tools that might help a developer to remember or to use it properly? Because, you know, it's kind of hard unless you are really deep into the topic. Yeah, so one, one thing I recommend for things like the labeling is not necessarily that you remember the syntax of every way to provide this additional information, but if you know that it's a thing that you should do, then you know, you know what you're looking for and you can go to the docs and you can find label and labeled by and describe and describe by and things like that. I think just getting into the mindset of like, I want to use ARIA to provide this additional information helps a lot. Um, you know, for other things like hidden, uh, hidden is like maybe one of five things, like hidden and live, I think, are just things you should try to remember, those five. And then for the other, things like, you know, I can have role equals directory. What I will do sometimes is just scan the table of contents of the ARIA headers, or sorry, of the ARIA roles, and just see, like, do any of these things seem like they apply to what I'm doing? And I'll just do that occasionally, uh, so I don't have to remember it that way. You had a question? Uh, yes, you grab the mic. Uh, do you have any advice for the um, mobile development? <laughs> yeah, so mobile development uh, is actually a little bit easier in that you're not going to have all these different screen readers here. On iOS and Android, there is TalkBack and uh, VoiceOver, and that's the only thing people can use. So you can just test on that and be good to go. Uh, I don't know specifically for mobile development like what their ARIA alternative is. I think for some of the things, it might be a little easier because you're going to see fewer like divs and other non-semantic things we can do on the web. It's like, this is the iOS list control. Um, but I'm sure that they have sort of equivalent things that you would look for. Any other questions? Alrighty, well, we're at time. So thank you guys for coming to my session.